I will tell you about the new ID3 beamline and especially about dark field X-ray microscopy because it's a relatively new technique. It's already 10 years old by now. Uh, time is flying, but it's still not all that well known, but it shows great promise as I will show you hopefully. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the all the viewers. I see that there are some people which either got up very, very early or are staying up quite late. So uh, welcome. And uh, I'm giving this presentation here on behalf of the ID3 team, which includes uh, Helen Isen, Raquel Rod uh, Rodri Rodriguez, uh, Thierry Brochard, Thomas Dufran, and uh, Jan Illitrim, and many other collaborators. So uh, Let's start with uh, what is dark field X-ray microscopy? How does it work? What can it be useful uh, used for? I will give uh, an overview and show some examples. I'll present you the software that we use to analyze this, which was developed here uh, at the ESRF by uh, Julia Garriga Ferrer. And uh, finally, the, the new beamline, which is optimized uh, for this technique and which is welcoming users now uh, it's currently under commissioning, but uh, the first US experiments are already uh, scheduled uh, starting in uh, the end of March. Uh, down below here, uh, for people that are looking on, on YouTube, for example, there's some publications that explain the, the details of the of the technique or reference. So what is X-ray, dark field X-ray microscopy and how does it work? What we do is uh, a combination of uh, X-ray Topography, where you put a sample into the beam and you align the Bragg reflection and then you do imaging on the Bragg diffracted beam. And X-ray microscopy, where you put a, a lens in between the sample and the detector, which magnifies the image and uh, in that way uh, increases the spatial resolution. And uh, in addition to acting as a magnifier, the objective lens also acts as a pinhole and with that, it increases the uh, the resolution in the angle of the scattered beam. So uh, by combining these uh, these two techniques and uh, especially working curve imaging, where you not only take one image of the diffractive beam, but where you can take images as a function of the sample angle, we can get a lot of information about the sample and uh, in particular about the Bragg planes. We have a detector that has a resolution of about one micrometer. The X-ray lens uh, is a compound refractive lens, uh, magnifies the image by a factor of 10 to 30. And that then gives a resolution at the sample in the order of you know, 100 nanometers to 30 nanometers in the ideal case. In practice, uh, uh, it's a little bit limited by the quality of the lenses. It's a full field method. That means that you get a complete image of the of the sample at uh, at each exposure, rather than uh, when you scan a, a small beam across the sample, where you need to scan the whole sample uh, with many data points before you get a complete image. It has a high spatial resolution and also high angular resolution at the same time, and it's a diffraction technique, which means that it's uh, sensitive to details of the crystal lattice. It's complementary to um, Electron microscopy, in, uh, in particular TEM, transmission electron microscopy. We have a worse spatial resolution, as was already mentioned, of about 150 nanometers compared to picometers that you can get with uh, electron microscopy. But we have the big advantage that by using hard X-rays, we, uh, we have a large penetration power. So we can use relatively large samples on the order of you know, a millimeter or a half a millimeter. Uh, depending on the material. We do not need to do very special surface treatments uh, compared to electron microscopy, where you need very, very thin slices. And typically, these are prepared in a destructive way. We have a very good angular resolution, which means we have a very good strain resolution. It's about 100 times better than standard TM. And uh, because we use x-rays, we can have the sample in air or inside inside a liquid, for example, or inside the capillary, and we do not need ultra high vacuum, which very strongly limits what you can do with the sample. For example, we can do electrochemistry, we can do uh, uh, gas atmospheres uh, and things like that. So uh, the main advantage really is that we can use 
bulk like samples and we can uh, because of that we can actually follow the evolution of the sample during in situ processing for example in metals annealing uh, applying temperature and and watching how defects in the crystal react to uh, to the temperature and evolve we can apply electric fields to ferroelectrics or functional materials we can apply mechanical strain which means we can pull on the sample and plastically deform it and see how it reacts all these uh, things we can do in a non-destructive way, meaning that we can take a measurement of the sample, see what it looks like, then do a, a modification like you know, mechanical classical deformation or apply a, a temperature step, and then see how uh, the same sample has transformed, how it has reacted. And we can do that in many steps and follow samples along the way. And we'll actually show you a couple of examples about that. Uh, this is important because real materials are actually multi-scale materials. You go from uh, length scales on the millimeter size, for example, of a, of a battery, to a uh, smaller structure of the um, you know, 10, 10 micrometer size, where you have anode structure with grains and, uh, and crystalline uh, particles. Then on the surface of those in a battery, you can have uh, damage on the surface because of migration of lithium or others. If you go more into details, you can see what these you know, cumulative defects, how they are composed of uh, individual defects like dislocations or, or tiny cracks or things like that, which are much smaller than the, than the micron scale. And finally, you can go to uh, individual atoms and lattice uh, disorder. That is something that we cannot do with this technique where we can cover the length scales from uh, a millimeter or submillimeter down to 100 nanometers or a little bit larger than that. And that is important for all kinds of uh, structural materials, functional materials, metals is very important, ceramics, um, minerals like geological minerals, but even uh, biomaterials and biominerals like uh, uh, seashells, for example, is an example that we have looked at. So, by being a diffraction technique, we are exploiting Bragg's law. And in Bragg's law, you have the wavelength, which is the wavelength of the X-rays. You have the lattice parameter D, and you have the angle between the X-ray beam and the, uh, the lattice planes uh, uh, theta. And if you have um, a distorted lattice, then several things can change. For example, the, the D-spacing can change. That's uh, shown on the right here which means that the, uh, the the crystal unit cell is stretched in the direction. The lattice can rotate. For example, if a, uh, a crystal breaks up into uh, into grains or small uh, uh, subgrains with small angle boundaries in between the grains, or you can have shear strain, which is more typically a, an elastic reaction where the uh, the crystal you know go, goes from a, a, cu a cubic or a square shape to this uh, rhomboid shape, and uh, these two uh, rotation and shear strain will change the angle between the X-ray and the lattice planes. And we can make images of how the lattice planes are oriented within the sample by using our technique. Uh, and uh, that way we can detect uh, strain and strain fields. We can defect, detect defects such as dislocations because the dislocations cause strain fields and we measure these. And we can uh, measure grain boundaries or domain boundaries if you have, for example, a, a sample that undergoes, undergoes a phase transition and, and forms different domains. So we measure the diffracted intensity and the image of the, of the diffraction as a function of the crystal orientation and a function of the scattering angle. The scattering angle, if you want to measure changes of the D-spacing and the crystal orientation, if you want to, uh, to detect uh, lattice rotation or shear strain. And in particular, the lattice rotation shear strain, we perform a series of measurements that we call a Moser CT scan. And in each case, we record a microscopy, microscopy image at each angle, and then we take the stack of, of images and analyze it. And this is an example here where at the bottom left, you can see the dot scanning the orientation of the sample in the parallel and uh, perpendicular to the uh, to the incident uh, beam angle. 
and then we record an image uh, at each of these positions, which you see at the top right. And you can just take the integrated intensity of these images and uh, plot that as a function of angle. That's what you see at the top left. And that gives you basically a reciprocal space map. But you can also just uh, sum up all these images, and then you get uh, the image at the at the uh, bottom right that you see being constructed. And you can further analyze it and calculate for each pixel the center of mass in this angular space and represent it by a color. Or you can uh, record, you can determine the, the peak width of each pixel. And these uh, these images, these these analyzed images, then tell you about the uh, the strain fields and the the change of strain across the field of view in the sample. And again, uh, we're looking at polycrystal materials, typically where we select one grain and then we align the Bragg reflection of that one grain. And within those grains, you know, within that grain, we can then see individual dislocations and uh, determine the strain fields and uh, from that back calculate the interactions between these strain fields, especially if they're moving. So key parameters is that typically we work uh, at photon energies between 15 and 20 kV, so hard X-rays that have some penetration through materials like you know, aluminum or steel or, or ceramics. Uh, the focal length of the objective is about 280 millimeters, which leaves quite a bit of space for sample environments between the sample and the lens. The uh, resolution we achieve in practice is about 150 nanometers. The theoretical resolution limit of the lenses we have is 60 nanometers, so we hope that by improving the optics, improving the uh, correcting the uh, aberrations of the component refractive lenses, we can improve that resolution. We are working on uh, integrating our technique with known other techniques as they're used, for example, in ID11, 3D XRD, and DCT. These are techniques that can measure the average orientation of each grain in such a sample. And that will provide the context of the one grain that we're looking at with, uh, with uh, dark field microscopy. And, uh, obtain information about you know, that grain interacts with the grains which are around it. We can obtain 3D information by uh, doing uh, essentially uh, section topography, which means that we focus the beam onto a line that illuminates a single isolated layer within the sample. And then we scan this line across the sample. And in that way, stacking up these, uh, these layers, we get a 3D volume. And then again, I will uh, show an example of this. Uh, a second method of doing that is to rotate the sample uh, uh, about the, uh, the diffraction vector, the Q vector, uh, by while illuminating it with a large beam. And that technique is called the topotomo. It's also being uh, developed currently on ID11. And we're also planning to uh, implement this on the new beamline on uh, ID3. So now that we know what the technique looks like, you know, what can it be used for? And uh, we have a whole wide field of, of applications. Our main user community right now is uh, looking at metallurgy, at the pattern formation upon uh, plastic deformation, uh, fatigue phenomena, and when you do thermal treatment at recovery and recrystallization, I will go into more detail. We have quite a lot of success also with functional materials where we can look at uh, the strain at grain boundaries. For example, when uh, you switch domains, uh, when you apply an electric field to a ferroelectric, the formation of domain patterns and the interaction with strain. We've looked at the uh, microstructure of biominerals, and we've also looked at uh, ceramics. And in the future, we hope to also look at uh, geological uh, minerals and uh, so there's there's room for more here. So the first example I'm going to show us about metallurgy. So this is a, a single crystal of aluminum which has been heated very close to the melting temperature, and uh, we can see, especially on the uh, on the right hand side, that uh, the dislocations which are in this uh, in this material become mobile and start to move around. 
so these are movies which you can do uh, with uh, with a full field technique with the exposure time of 100 milliseconds which we hope to speed up with the new beam line and uh, depending on where you are on the temperature scale you can see different types of uh, of movement and, and interactions between the dislocation structures here. This was uh, work carried out by uh, Leroy Dresselhaus Marais and John Yildrim. Uh, so uh, here you can see a movie where you can see individual dislocations moving across the sample and finally arranging themselves in a straight line, which is the configuration of, of minimal energy. And uh, that's an effect which is which is quite classical, but uh, which so far has not been observed in situ. And uh, we can measure the movement of these dislocations, their speed, their, uh, and at the same time we can see the strain fields, and uh, from that we can calculate the interaction energies, and we can compare that to uh, uh, to models. And in, in this case, where we're at 99% of the melting temperature, it's clearly a thermal effect that dominate the, these interactions. Uh, another example is, in this case, a static example where we uh, made uh, section topography, so measured many, many layers, again, in a single crystal of aluminum. And uh, in each of these layers, we can identify uh, where dislocations cross this illuminated layer, and then stack them all up. In, uh, into a 3D volume here, you see the uh, the sequence of layers, and you can see that in each layer the dislocations are crossing in a different uh, in a different position. Uh, by assembling this into a 3D volume, you can see that the dislocations are arranged in planes. Uh, these these are boundary planes between uh, subgrains, and uh, there is a small orientation difference between. Uh, between the volumes on the left and right side, on opposite sides of, of these uh, boundaries. And in this case, we carefully analyzed the orientation of these boundaries because there's also theoretical models that predict in which direction the dislocation lines should run and which direction they should uh, then arrange to form a plane. And uh, again, compare this to, to models. Again, work from John Yildirim and uh, Henning Poulsen and uh, Leo Adresselhaus Marie. Uh, next example is on functional materials. This is work that was carried out by the group of Hugh Simons, uh, looking at uh, barium titanate. And in this case, we can very clearly see paraelectric domains on the on the left. You can see the domain walls very clearly, but we can also see the lattice strain, and uh, we see that the lattice strain actually extends over length scales that are comparable or even larger than the typical domain size. That means that the entire domain is strained, which means that with, uh, throughout the entire domain, the, the symmetry of the crystal is, is broken, and that removes uh, several selection uh, criteria for, for uh, which are imposed by symmetry or, would, or which would be imposed by symmetry in a perfect crystal on how uh, the crystal can react to electric fields, how the electric polarization of the domains can rotate, for example. So this this is, uh, is quite important because theoretical models always assume that you have a perfect crystals and that domain boundaries are just just lines on, on paper and then you have a perfect crystal on the left and on the right side of the domain boundaries. This work here very clearly shows that this is not the case. Good. So uh, here you can see that uh, these measurements were performed first on a on a sample before it sees an electric field, and then you can apply start applying electric field and go through the hysteresis loop and see how the domains grow, how the domain types change. On the in the second on the first two images, we have a lot of images which are aligned in one di diagonal direction, and then when you start to apply field, the main domain boundaries are actually oriented at 90 degrees to that. You can correlate that to the reciprocal space maps and see which volumes of the reciprocal space in each each corner, if you want, corresponds to a different domain type. How these are populated and uh, how this how this changes when you go through the hysteresis loop. And again, this is possible because the the technique is uh, 
is non-destructive on the, on the bulk material. Good, uh, just a very brief introduction of the software that we have. Uh, it's called Darfix. Uh, it's a workflow package and uh, it contains a series of widgets which you can chain together for all essential steps in the data processing, like data selection, you know, which scans do you want to analyze, pre-processing for removing noise, hot pixels, selecting a region of interest, uh, correcting for background, and then the main processing steps like detecting a center of mass uh, or variance, uh, peak width, we can fit one and two dimensional Gaussians. And uh, a more experimental module is uh, it's a blind source separation module, which uses uh, principal component analysis and non-negative matrix factorization to automatically, without uh, operator interaction, can detect uh, domains and, uh, and, uh, and, and subgrains and so on in, uh, in these, uh, these scans. Uh, this is by now published. I should update the slide. So here you can see an example where we have a first widget on the left or where we select data. It automatically detects metadata like motor positions and the user can then confirm that this is really the scan direction that we want to analyze. You can select the region of interest, remove noise, just following from the left to the right. Apply a shift correction, which corrects for a mechanical uh, alignment error when, uh, when we do scans that the, the center rotation is not exactly within the, the grain that we're looking at. That will then, if you rotate, shift the image, which each angular step, so that can be corrected. And then we get uh, as output rocking curves or grain plots and, uh, and blind source separation. And all this is implemented in a very nice and user-friendly package that is uh, open source. So uh, everybody that wants to contribute to the project is, of course, very welcome to do that. You can also look at the source and see how exactly things are done. Uh, it's maintained by the ESRF, so if there's uh, requests for features or bug reports, uh, they can report it uh, to us and uh, we'll take care of that. And uh, this this is a very big step forward to uh, compared to the early days when basically for each experiment we had to write our own uh, Python or MATLAB scripts to uh, to analyze the data. Uh, and finally, we'll get to the new beamline, ID3, uh, which is um, now undergoing commissioning. So ID3 replaces uh, ID6 HXM, which is uh, which was the place where the, the technique was first developed about 10 years ago and uh, has been an, an user operation. Uh, for about a year before the EBS shutdown and one and a half years after the EBS shutdown. Um, and the uh, idea of the project is to build a fully optimized beamline for dark field microscopy as a dedicated beamline. So it means that we double the amount of beam time that's available before it was time shared which, uh, with the large volume press on the ID6. We um, have a pink, pink beam option now, which provides almost 100 times more flux than before. We have one of the latest generation cryogenic permanent magnet undulators, U16, which produces uh, many, many, many photons. Uh, and we are uh, getting a new sample goniometer that's op optimized for topotomo uh, measurements uh, for, for 3D volume measurements of the, uh, of the sample. So the uh, the new beamline reuses the end station that was built and was developed on ID6, which was fairly recent there also, and which is already uh, well optimized. But all the beamline optics and all the infrastructure around it is uh, is built from scratch, and uh, the project is now nearing completion. So one and a half years ago in March, there was uh, empty floor on ID3. Then we started to, to receive the wall panels for the radiation hutches. We had to do a modification of the floor to uh, be able to support the 20 ton uh, granite bench. Uh, then when last, about a year ago, we had the new floor ready for installation of the instrument. And that's also the moment when the operation on ID6 stopped because we had to dismantle the bench and then put it in place here on ID3. 
And uh, now we have the optics uh, almost fully installed and uh, the bench has found its new home in the, in the new hutch and there's still a little bit of cabling work going on. But we have now completed the radiation test on the optics hutch and the uh, experiment hutch. We have the pink beam, uh, which is a scary intensity. And uh, we're looking forward to welcoming the first users in, uh, after the March shutdown next year. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Karsten, for this nice presentation. So uh, I see that there are some questions. Uh, and I invite you, all the participants, to uh, make their question using the answer uh, uh, question, not the chat. Uh, so the first question is, uh, uh, by Andrei Petukov. Thank you, Karsten, for the overview. How about bright field microscopy, for example, for colloidal crystals? Yeah, Andrei. Andrei has actually also been one of the early contributors to the project on uh, on ID6 still, and we have done some experiments on colloids with him. This will be possible on, uh, on ID3 also, uh, in, in small angle scattering. And uh, basically, simply by driving the detector down into the into the bright field beam, into the straight beam. So uh, yes, it can be done. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there are no questions. I have got one for you. I see at the end that you are uh, going to provide beam time. Uh, in the next month, so these uh, there will be, be possibility to apply proposal for the next uh, with the next call for proposal. Uh, yes, actually, already the proposal call in September was open, and ah. we've received uh, fourteen approximately fourteen proposals, and we've accepted ten of them uh, that will be carried out in the uh, in the run starting in uh, in uh, March uh, until the summer. Okay, uh, so I don't. Okay, there is another question by Didier Vermeil. Uh, thanks, Karsten. How big of a volume can you scan? The field of view that we have uh, is typically about 100 micrometers. So, in Topo Tomo, it would be 100, uh, 100 uh, micrometers diameter and 100 micrometers high. Uh, if you do a layer by layer scan, then of course uh, the question is how much time you have. You know how many how many layers can you stack up? We have another question by Andrei Petukov. Can you explain in more detail what do you mean by zero point zero zero one percent strain resolution? Yes, um, that is is calculated basically from the. Uh, from the angular resolution, which is limited by the divergence of the incident beam and by the angular acceptance of the diffracted beam, the um, resolution function is not symmetric. So not not all strains have this very high resolution. But the uh, if you put in a, a silicon crystal, for example, you would be able to to measure that in the rocking direction because the divergence of the incident beam is is very very small. Basically, the rocking curve resolution. Okay, uh, I've got another question. Uh, okay, now we have another question of a participant by Charles McMonagel. What sample environments do you currently have available? So we mostly rely at this point on sample environments from the from the pool, ESRF sample environment pool. So we have a. Uh, cryogenic gas stream, a liquid nitrogen stream, which gets us down to about 100 Kelvin. We uh, use the hot air blower from the sample environment pool, which gets us to um, uh, about, about seven or 800 degrees. Uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to precisely measure the, the temperature because it depends very much on how close you can get the nozzle to the sample. 
and we are we have users that have provided um, a uh, a strain cell, so a, a load cell where you can apply mechanical strain to the sample. We will uh, work on making a version 2.0 of an infrared furnace that can get up to a thousand degrees. So it's very interesting for steel research, for example. Uh, that is not available yet, but that is uh, is a project for for the next year to develop that. And then users can bring their own environments. Of course, uh, we've had people bringing uh, cells for applying electric fields, for uh, applying electric pulses, for for pulse heating, and and things like that. Okay, we have a question by Leonardo Soares de Oliveira: How fast the acquisition of the strain scans? will take in comparison to the old ET6 setup? So we um, we have a new detector, which should provide uh, about a two times better signal to noise ratio. So that should double the speed. And then we hope to get in the monochromatic beam at least three times more intensity than before. So that would be a factor of six faster than, uh, than before under uh, identical conditions. Thank you. I got a question by Didier Vermeil. How much is the scary flux you have with your Invac ondulator pink beam? We haven't really measured it yet, but the um, calculations show that in the uh, most extreme case, the power, the beam power in the pink beam is up to 140 watts in about one square millimeter. So that's that's quite scary for me. We have a question about Alexandra Chmukova. What is the minimum sample size and average size for single crystal or multi-scale object? Yeah. So the, the minimum size, typically we, we try to get grains or crystalline uh, elements uh, on the order of about a micrometer, because that way we can get something like 10 pixels to be able to see something inside that inside that object. Um, having much smaller objects, basically you can resolve anything. So it's, I don't think it's so interesting. The dislocation core is very small, but the strain fields around the dislocation core extend over a very long distance. So we can see them because of that. Um, the field of view, as I said, is about 100 micrometers, so that's uh, often a typical sample size. But we can we can penetrate uh, samples without losing all of our intensity, which are on the order of uh, of a millimeter or so, uh, for not too high Z materials. So for aluminum or for for oxides, that usually works quite well. Okay, we have a question by Karsten Richter. How the aperture of the objective lenses and therefore the relevant acceptance angle impacts on the imaging? How is the high resolution into theta actually assured? Well, the high resolution into theta is, comes from the fact that you have a uh, an effective aperture of the lens, which is about 300 micrometers at a distance of about 300 millimeters from the sample. So that's uh, about, um, about a milliradian simply because the lenses absorb and the absorption increases if you go away from the from the optical axis. Um, the, uh, the aperture of the lenses, of course, imposes a diffraction limit. And as I said, the diffraction limited for, of one, one milliradian at, uh, at X-ray energies is on the order of 60 nanometers or something like that, but currently actually uh, the the operations dominate the uh, the uh, the point spread function, so we we do not reach the diffraction limit. And finally, um, typically what we do is we we measure in transmission with uh, by illuminating a line beam, and then of course you see a projection of the illuminated layer. Uh, looking at at the plane from the angle of the diffracted beam, which is uh, 
15 degrees or something like that with the diffraction, the, the two theta angle is, is 30 degrees. So that, that projection actually degrades the, the effective resolution also. And that is something that is solved by the topotomo technique because then you rotate what is in the in the projected direction also to the perpendicular direction. And by doing a 3D reconstruction of all the images, uh, you, you recover the good resolution in, in all directions. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, there are no more questions. I've got one last uh, for you about the, the resolution. Yes. Um, we see that uh, the resolution is not comparable with that obtained by electron diffraction, but uh, the advantage of, uh, of X-ray is that we probe a larger amount of volume of a sample. Yep. So uh, are you confident that in the next years uh, it will be possible to significantly increase uh, uh, your resolution? Uh, it all depends on what you call significant. We will never be able to reach the um, the resolution mm -hmm. of electron microscopy because there are intrinsic limits of the lenses, and one of them is that they are absorbing, and because of that, there is uh, an effective aperture which is on the order of 300 micrometers uh, at best, uh, which which is simply given by by physics. So. Mm -hmm. Going beyond the resolution limit of 50 or 60 nanometers will be very, very difficult. We would have to completely change the type of optics that we use. We can no longer use refractive lenses. We would have to go to something uh, like we've done first tests with multi-layer lower lenses where we can get uh, larger, um, larger effective aperture, larger numerical aperture, but at the cost of uh, having a much, much smaller working distance. So then having any kind of sample environment becomes a, a big challenge. And second, the multi-layer lower lenses also, they do not uh, magnify in a straightforward direction like the, the compound refractive lenses, but you have to look at the diffracted beam and diffracted, if you want to make a two-dimensional image, diffracted first in one direction, another direction. So you have your diffracted beam that goes off at a, at a very strange angle. And that is, is technically quite challenging. We've done tests on that, but uh, it's 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 quite difficult to use. So we are almost at the resolution limit. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. And then, Thank of you. course, you're know, going from uh, mechanical stability of 100 nanometers to 10 nanometers also is not not obvious, although we've done everything we can on the on the design to uh, to have a very stable uh, temperature, for example, and uh, use crinite in as many places as possible to avoid mechanical vibrations. But it is it is challenging and it becomes more challenging the smaller you go. Thank you. There is Adriana that uh, maybe want to ask something. Yeah, yes, um, I have a question on the biological samples. So would it be uh, um, feasible to uh, study the implants, uh, I mean, um, materials which are going to, uh, uh, to uh, um, um, to cross with uh, the uh, uh, the bone, for example, so a mix between uh, um, uh, natural material and uh, uh, and titan oxide, for example. I think it's possible. It's probably not possible on a on a real world sample, but if you make a make a specialized sample that has the the appropriate dimensions, it should be possible uh, with bone. I believe that the uh, the crystalline elements are very very small, so they're they're smaller than what we can resolve. But uh, in the in the titanium metal, it should be possible to see something. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, thinking really about the, the interface between uh, yeah. the uh, the implant and the bone. It should be should be possible. What of course we're very interested in is always evolution uh, in, in the chemical environment. So. Mm -hmm. I think in your case, what you would probably be interested in is some kind of accelerated aging or something like that, and see how the how the titanium yeah. or titanium oxide surface uh, reacts during the accelerated aging, which which you can do with an electrochemical mm -hmm. cell or something like that. Uh, that I think is possible. Yes, we've not done it, but it should be possible. Thank you. 